Philippians chapter 4 tonight. Now, I want to kind of pick up where we left off last time we were here and kind of getting on this portion of Scripture here where Paul kind of transitions into a different section here as he's kind of concluding on some things here. And he kind of gives these words of encouragement and reminding them that the peace of God is really necessary for their lives, the peace of God to to work in their lives. And the peace of God is accessible. It's there. It's, It's for their receiving and their partaking. And so we're kind of working through some of the things of how this kind of comes about in the life of the child of God. And he says in these words of encouragement and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And so in a sense, we can say that this is the way to have peace. This is what really counteracts, you know, anxiousness or an anxious heart. It's, it's having calm. It's having peace. Right. And so he's saying here that this peace or the peace of God, which is really. You know, the only peace that can really do for us, the world has its version of peace. Humanity has its version of peace, but true peace. Peace, the peace of God only comes from the Lord. And that's that's what calms the heart of man, humanity. So the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds. And notice how he's saying how it comes through Christ Jesus. So the point being made here is that we see that. You know, Paul gives the antidote or the medicine, if you will, for an anxious heart to them. And he's saying here, this is it, the peace of God. So we looked at six thought patterns and we started to look at them. We just looked at the word, you know, whatever's true. And we're going to pick up there. But these thought patterns, they invite the peace of God. And so tonight, as we kind of continue building on this, Paul encourages them with this thought to think on praiseworthy things. And and how we think does determine the outcome. It does determine the outcome. And so, you know, of of our lives and our decisions and how we deal with things and how we take things in and so on and so forth. But we do need the word of God. As we looked at last week, kind of closing in this section to saturate our minds that that we ourselves may may be renewed and and really keep from allowing the enemy to bombard our minds or to be offended or to take things in in a way that you know would kind of take us off course so he highlights the importance of thinking upon admirable things remember when we kind of ended on this note what's true not false think about what's honest not Um, or honorable, not dishonorable. Think about what's just, not unjust. Think about what's pure, not what's impure. And what is lovely, not repulsive. What is commendable, not wrong. And think about what what is morally excellent, not filthy. And think about what's admirable, not shameful. So the verb here that Paul is using when he goes on to say, meditate on these things. You see the word there, meditate, in verse 8. That verb there in the Greek is the Greek word logizame, which actually means to take into account carefully, to, to calculate. So in other words, it's not just simply saying, hey, you know, just think on positive vibes, right? As the world will say today, and, you know, just let's remove negativity in our lives and everything will be okay. No, he's saying, to really take inventory of these things, to to take them in, because in taking them in, they they affect what comes out. And remember, Jesus says this in Matthew 12 in regards to the heart and what's in the heart actually comes out. Right. So he talks about 
you know, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So with that thought in mind, we, we, we see that, that pattern in that picture where we understand that whatever is in us, whatever's in our heart, what we take in, what we think upon, um, those things are important because through circumstances, what we take in will come out. So if you're taking in things that are, you know, let's just say negative and things that are, you know, um, difficult and maybe you're not filling your heart and your mind with the word of God, but with other things, then those are the things that are going to come out. And think about it. Those are the things that if it's not the word of God, those are the things that are not useful. They're not needful. Your your situation or circumstance will be a very difficult one and will continue to be a difficult one until there is deliverance and deliverance comes from, as we see all throughout scripture, when one turns to the Lord. And if the word of God is not in you, there's nothing there to instruct you to turn to the Lord. So now you find yourself trying to manage things that are difficult in life with Without the word of God, without the Lord, without the leading and the directing. And, and you know what? There'll never be peace. So you look at this and you begin to see here that Paul is saying, take inventory of this. He says, do well, do well to consider, do well to ponder, do well to consider carefully and reflect on the virtuous things in this life. So what are these virtuous things? Well, notice here that there are some important things that we have to consider to calculating this whole point. I think these just looking at truth. Let's just look at that just for a little bit that, you know, he's telling the Philippians, you must contemplate, you must calculate, you must take inventory on truth, whatever is true. So think about that right now. Whatever is true. What is true for us? And this has a lot to do, he, he, which here truth is in the broadest and most comprehensive sense, right? Because as believers, we know what truth is. Truth actually defines who we are as believers. So followers of Christ, well, truth begins where? Not with the word itself, but with his divine person. Jesus is truth. Jesus is the truth. He says it in John 14, 6. And because it begins there, and for the Christian, this is what we see at the very beginning, the divine person, God the Son, this embodiment of truth. In other words, this is what we know. At least this is what we should be believing, that Jesus is the truth, the only truth, the absolute truth. And then we kind of come to this understanding. He is all truth. And his message is truth. The gospel is truth. Paul, in writing to the Colossians in chapter one and verse five, he says, because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. The truth of the gospel. You know, today we live in a world that is filled with lies. And people say this, we don't even know what's true anymore. I mean, you know, there was a worry before of like, you know, being influenced too much by YouTube. And well, before any of the, you know, computer stuff started or social media, it was always like, you know, certain TV shows, right? The television. And then, you know, it, it goes to, you know, shows that begin to change, you know, to reality TV shows. Those reality TV shows are pretty raw, right? And and it starts to get worse. And then social media, then and people now, this is where people get their truth. They get their truth from TV, from the media, from reality TV shows. And, and like, you know, in other words, they you got all kinds of shows now that that cover all kinds of things in this life that are vile and we treat them as 
it being okay as something being that we should be okay with because after all, we do live in a fallen world. But, you know, there should be some sense of conviction where we realize and say, man, if we, if we watch enough of this and fill ourselves with this, then this becomes our reality. It becomes our reality. And then we start to think, well, this is how I guess life is. This is how we live. And, you know, we started to, the reality show started changing to like families, like, uh, you know, large families, right? With all these kids and people start watching this, man, you know, Kate plus eight, you know, and all these things. And, and, and it started with that. But if you notice now, there's more and more of these reality shows taking place. And, and what begins to happen in the grand scheme of all this, you begin to see these families become ruined. They, they, they become ruined by really the, the, the whole, you know, TV and, and Hollywood and, and everything. And you begin to see these families break down. And then you have these shows, you know, these large families, and it's kind of like, you know, they're good families, they're wholesome families, and initially in the beginning. And, and we watch because we're like, well, they're talking about God, and they're, you know, they're, there's references to the Lord there, so we just assume it's a Christian show, but it's not. It's a reality TV show. And you start to watch that, and then that becomes gospel to you. It, it, it becomes... Now something that you're and then, you know, you're kind of like, you know, oh man, I hope Pastor David finishes early because my favorite show comes out at 830. And sometimes he goes almost there and I'm going to miss it. And just think about it. That becomes what you're taking in. The beauty of serving the Lord and being a Christian and a child of God is that Christ is in us. That's that's what it goes on to say. Also here in Colossians, Christ in us, the hope of of glory, right? That we have that in us because of who Jesus is. To them, God will to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Chapter one of Colossians in verse 27. Don't worry, I'm not going to teach out of Colossians tonight, but. And I'm not going there next after we're done. We're going to start the gospel of Luke after we're done here with Philippians. But you, you see here that it's that it's who Jesus is. So God's word says. It says it's truth. It, it tells us, you know, remember when Jesus, you know, is praying to the father in John 17 in verse 17. These are the words that he says. He says here, sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth. So God's word is truth. The gospel is truth. Jesus is truth. He is the embodiment of truth. And everything that is true is from God. Why? Because God is all truth. God is truth truth and all truth is God's truth. And this is what Paul is saying to the Philippians. A mind that contemplates what is true. So let's just look at this in the sense here that we see Jesus in this. A mind that contemplates what is true only sees Jesus. You know, the world hates that. The world, the world hates when, when you apply Jesus to everything, even, even the difficulty that's happening in the world. And you say, I, I know why this is happening, because there's sin in the world. But Jesus came to die on the cross for your sin. And the world's like, be quiet with that. Where is your God when all these things are taking place and all these difficulties are happening, all these things? Well, you know, the Lord is there. And Jesus is truth. Circumstances don't change who the truth is. And Paul will talk about circumstances being those things that, that don't change our position in the Lord. But kind of applying this principle to truth, when you contemplate this, you only see Christ, you only see the word, and you only see the gospel. And then rationally, you begin to gauge, engage the creation of God. You begin to engage what you see, you reject irrational thinking. You begin to look and you begin to say, ah, that doesn't sound right. 
and you begin to speak truth, even in situations that are perhaps maybe confusing and discouraging, you still speak the truth. The mind will seek whatever is true when you begin to contemplate on the one who is truth. And this is what Paul is saying here. In every avenue in life, doesn't matter if it's faith, doesn't matter if it's science, doesn't matter if it's relationships, doesn't matter if it's civil or public life, to business life, in everything, we see Christ in it. And you measure life that way. So you take all of these thought patterns here that Paul's about to speak about, and so with truth, we kind of look at that and we say, okay, so what does the Lord mean by whatever is true? Well, he's expanding this idea of truth. Not only should we think about whatever's true, not only should we contemplate about whatever's true, but we should also practice what is true. We should also think about what is honorable and what is right and what is pure and what is lovely as he's going down this whole list. And, and what he's saying here is that when a person contemplates these things, and this is what Paul is saying, because Paul's not saying, hey, do as I say, not as I do. Paul is contemplating these things where he's at. So it's obviously changing the outcome of Paul's life here. And he's saying, hey, listen, we have the truth. We need not to worry. And this mindset, he's helping his readers to understand that there's an important relationship between truth and these other qualities. And he also challenges them to practice these things. So not only think about it, but practice them. And then the outcome of thinking on whatever is true and having a walk in life that practices and reflects this truth. Then the peace of God will be with those who think upon these things, who think and walk in that way. And, you know, the Bible makes it very clear. We need not to worry that God is already with those who believe. That's why I'm saying because we're in Christ. So this should encourage us. We've been with Jesus for a while. We have the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit. The Philippians here, Paul wasn't saying, hey, you got to go find this truth. It's kind of like that phrase. I don't know if these were the last words that Buddha said, but, you know, they say that be on his deathbed, his final words were, I have yet to find truth. The implication there would be that his whole life has been, have been a quest for truth. He's on this journey for truth. And, and that is kind of how humanity is. We're on this journey trying to fulfill needs in our own personal lives that, that only God can fill. And, and ultimately, if those were his final words, well, Jesus comes on the scene and Jesus says, I am the way. I am the truth. And I am the life. So in essence, we can say what he was seeking was Jesus all along. What he was seeking was Jesus all along. Now, this is really important because you apply this not only to truth, but he goes on to say here, you know, with this thing of truth, whatever's noble. And each of these thought patterns, kind of like God's peace, is based on truth, listen to this, not on circumstances. And you have to, you can't separate the circumstance that Paul is in right now. He's in prison. They're not. They're out. They're, you know, they're, it's the church. He's writing this letter. He's encouraging them. And so in other words, what he's saying is kind of separate circumstances from the reality of who God is. Even in the most difficult circumstances, we can still have God's peace by following what? His recipe. In order to stand firm in him, we, we have several things we have to do. We have to think on these things. We have to take in his word. We have to pray. And we have to trust him. And when we stand firm and we have this peace, we need to think on whatever is true. And we need to access the truth that he has provided for us. And that's really what Paul is saying. And that truth is found in the word of God, right? Isn't that what the psalmist says in Psalm 119? 
In verse 160, it says, The sum of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous rules endures forever. Think about a person who says they have a relationship with God, and then they just have this poor outlook on life. It doesn't make you want to serve God if that's how they look at life. You know, it... it all they're doing is complaining and griping and, oh, you know, life is so hard. And why all these, you know, and you look at this and you say, well, aren't you a child of God? Aren't you a Christian? Aren't you a person who's walking in the truth? Aren't you a person who, and you want to know what? They might verbalize that, but if you're not in the word and you're not practicing these things, then obviously that's what your life's going to be. It's going to be miserable. Miserable. Now, <laughs> misery loves company, so you, you don't have to go that far to find somebody else to lick your wounds. <laughs> and, and the enemy loves to keep people that way. He loves to trap you. He loves to, he loves to trap, trap you, you know, in, in that mode of thinking that, hey, you know, this, this, is, just, this is just it. But this is why you got to surround yourself with, with those that are in the word. So they encourage you. They spur you on also. They spur you on also to be in the word and, and encourage you to, to partake. I mean, that's what, that's what this is about. That's what Wednesday night Bible study is about. To come and, and hear the word of God. And, and this is my, you know, people say, oh, you know, well, I, I'd probably be a lot better of a Christian if I, if I spent more time with Pastor David. There's, there's nothing you can rub off my hand that's going to make you more godly. But I'll tell you what, you can come hang out with me on Sunday morning, Sunday night and Wednesday night. Really? Yes. Just sit down and listen. And we'll get in the word of God together and we'll see what God has to say for not only myself, but you as well. And then we take God's word and we apply it to our circumstance and our situation. And then we begin to see that God's word actually supersedes anything that we could ever experience or be going through. And it's not just about listening to a good sermon and saying, oh, that was good, man. I really needed to hear that. It's also, man, I need to do that. Can I get an amen? amen. Wow. That's a good word, guys. I mean, this is all Paul's telling him, and he can't be there. And he's he's kind of like, you know, this is the answer to your struggle. Did the Philippians have a struggle? Absolutely, they did. He addressed it a couple of times. Maybe not like some of the other churches, but they were going through stuff. And, and he's giving them insight and he's saying, this is what you must do. The problem today with the body of Christ is we take the messages and the teachings as suggestions. Rather than commands. And Paul is not telling them, hey, you know, maybe when you get around to this and, and, and maybe when you want to think on whatever's true, you know, just no. He's saying, guys, meditate. Ligozame in the original language in the Greek. What is he saying? Carefully calculate these things. What is truth? Think about that for a moment. And I tell today, you know, it's like all is relative, you know, relativism, they call it right. Your truth is not my truth. And, you know, it's so funny because <clears throat> because that whole thing of being a free thinker the the liberals today call it critical thinking that's not critical thinking they've hijacked that but today it's kind of like well i'm going to protest my truth it might not be yours but it's mine and so i'm going to do this and i'm going to do it to the and it was funny because you know my wife brought up a good point we're watching these protests we're seeing you know people protesting they don't even know why they're doing it they don't they don't even know nothing. It's crazy, some of the stuff that, oh, my goodness. And, and she says this. She says, they just need to take all those people that really believe in this because they're protesting in the wrong place. And they just need to gather all of them up 
and take them to Gaza. And they can protest there. And it's funny because today I'm reading in the news and it says that a new bill, they're trying to pass it in the House right now. And so Republicans are saying anybody who is arrested and is charged for illegal protesting, like what's going on in the colleges, because all the, you know, they're breaking laws by doing this. He says they, they will be sentenced to six months in Gaza. I'm like, dude, I'll vote for that one. Like, so my wife's a prophetess now, but you know, it, it's not far fetched because the reality is this. They don't know what they're protesting for. They do not know. And it just goes to show you when a person does not have truth, but they have their truth, how far they are willing to go. It's mind blowing. So allowing the word of God to, to dwell richly in you. If you're allowing God's word to do that. And the word of God is in your heart, then we will experience this kind of joy and this kind of peace. That God intends for us to enjoy. Thinking on whatever's true, being prayerful, being thankful, all these things. Paula will continue on to go say, so let's think of the things that are noble. What does that mean for you and me? What is how does this translate to us? Well, if you look at it here, the idea behind the word noble is, is really that kind of which is integral. And Paul here is challenging them. The things that are noble. How can we devote our minds to thinking on whatever is noble? In the original language, the Greek word for noble actually means honorable and anything worthy of being honored or entitled to honor and respect. This is what he's saying. So in other words, you know, submitting to whatever is noble refers to this idea of lofty, majestic, awesome things, things that lift the mind above the world's sin, above the world's dirt, above the world's scandal above the world's lies above the world's wickedness that's that's what nobility is so as he's encouraging them and he's giving them this thought and he's saying listen it it's a heart attitude and this will ultimately reflect and influence the way we the way we live you know that your heart is like a fountain from which your emotions will flow in circumstances and situations. People will see what's truly in your heart. And this is why we have to always be taking inventory of our heart. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23, it says, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. So when you guard your heart, guys, listen with correct thinking, like whatever's true, whatever's noble, everything we sue, do and everything we, we say in life will, will reflect what's in our heart. Noble thinking. You know, our society, as we're talking about, doesn't take much to see this, guys. It's constantly bombarding us with things to think about that are not noble. And you can get lost in, you know, seeing some of the scandals Anybody peruse some of those scandals on social media? Anybody here? Any takers? You know, like, oh, wow, look at what's happening to, you know, I don't know, a famous singer. Or, you know, you start to look at this like, oh, man, their life's all messed up. Well, what do you expect? Look at them. <laughs> look how they're living. And, and you're consumed with, with these celebrities that you don't even know. Dirty secrets, like, oh, man. They're going to expose somebody there you are like you gotta know but that's how the world goes you see moral entertainment and pornography and sexual promiscuity and godless living all of these things they drag our thoughts down you know and eventually not only our thoughts but our actions 
and our lives, in a sense, can go there mentally and be taken into the gutter of this world. And you start to look at life this way, you start to say, wow, you know what, well, you know, some of those things can be entertaining to our flesh. We look at it, we're like, wow, I can't believe they did that. Well, I can. And that's why people get all excited, you know, when this when a celebrity says Jesus. <laughs> like, oh, they're a new Christian. Like, no, they're not, man. <laughs> no, they're not. Oh, yeah, they said Jesus in Jesus' name. I said, the devil says that. <laughs> You know, it, it's, it's, this, it's this way in which they look at God. When they say that and their life is lived contrary to the word of God, it just goes to show you what they think of the God you serve, the one who gave his life for our sins. Like, oh, you know, I just need a little bit of time with him. I can reach him. <laughs> you know, <laughs> only God can reach those hearts. Amen? But if you think about it, it goes back to that whole thing. How can we see? Who do we have as an example in this world? We have nobody. So no matter how we try, I mean, you, you really look at this and, you know, we I just was watching a, a couple of uh, things the other night, last night, actually falling half asleep, but I couldn't help but stay up and try to listen to these stories of the uh, Jehovah's Witness and, you know, people kind of coming out and just an interesting story of an 89 year old that left the watchtower and tracks the site. It's just crazy thing. So I'm watching it. But then I also kind of perusing to those. I seen this one that said. Rabbi Zacharias. And his great fall. And I thought, man, here was one that the Christian community looked up to. And then all this stuff comes out after he dies. All this sexual sin, everything, abuse and rape and all these things that just came out. And people, oh, there's just accusations. He's not here to defend himself. And his wife comes out and says, it's true. And his children running the ministry and they, they don't even know what to do. They've lost so much funding and all these things. And it's like, that's what he's known for. At the end of his life. Whereas Ravi Zacharias was like, nobody dared to debate this man or, you know, and all of his. And it's like, what do we do with his material? Well, I, hey, I chew the meat, spit out the bone, man. But it just goes to show we have no examples in this earth. The only example we have is found in the word of God as we study the life of the person of Jesus Christ. And you might say, well, that's the Bible is written, you know, thousands of years ago. And Jesus was here over 2000 years ago. And, you know, they didn't have AI back then and IG and Facebook and and any of that, you know, and. It doesn't matter. If we try to relegate Jesus to a particular time, then we miss what Revelation 13, 8 says. He was the lamb that was slain before the foundations of the earth. He was here before he was here during and he will be here after. So he transcends all time. So we look to Jesus and we say, and I know this is cliche, but I have to say it. What would Jesus do? <laughs> and this is kind of what Paul is saying here. Let me encourage you with these things. And Paul says in Romans chapter one in verse 18, when we don't think of noble things, ungodly, ignoble thinking will suppress the truth in our minds. It will. So if you're into all that junk. Don't. If you get kind of, oh, yeah, I'm trying to see what's going on now. What's, what's happening with the Kardashians keeping up? Who's trying to keep up with the Kardashians? I mean, really think about it. Like, oh, you know, I'm keeping up with the kind. You know, I remember one time this brother told me, he's like, oh, I got to go watch the keeping up with the Kardashians, you know. And I'm like, bro, you're a cochino, bro. That's like a perverted show, man. He's like, oh, no, 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 no. Bruce is a Christian. <laughs> I wonder what he thinks now, you know. <laughs> I don't even think it's politically correct to call him Bruce. <laughs> oh, 
oh, no, they believe in the Lord, man. The mom got ordained and she did a wedding. I'm like, you, you got to be kidding me. How's that working for you now? <laughs> the most honorable thing we can contemplate, guys, listen and take in is the word of God. Do not forget that. Psalm 103, or excuse me, Psalm 1 in verses 1 through 3, it says this. It's, it extols the blessing and joys of the one who rejects the ignoble. Notice what it says. Counsel of the wicked, but delights in the law of the Lord. The person who meditates upon it day and night. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seats of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree. Planted by the rivers of water. Firmly planted and rooted, guys. The Bible says in Isaiah uh, chapter 32, it speaks of this in, in verse 8. It says, but he who is noble plans noble things, and on noble things he stands. So let's fix our mind on those things. He goes on to say here, whatever things are just. Now those things that are just, really the idea behind that which is just, really means that which is right. That which is right. Guard their hearts with those things that are right. How can we guard our mind in thinking about whatever is right? In the original language, that's what the word just means. It means justice. It means moral right. It means proper. And in the King James, the New King James, trans, they translate it with this term, the word just, and it relates to others. It doesn't just mean things that are just. It means you acting just with others, being right with other people. It is, it is an act that is demonstrated in how you respond to others. So thinking right thoughts steers one away from quarrels and issues to get into. In the sense, that could relate to them big time. Why? Because just in the same chapter, he's dealing with an issue in the church. And sometimes what happens, the first thing that goes in dealing with people's complaints or problems in the church is that that's the first thing that goes thinking right of the situation we think wrong or bad because we've heard some bad news or we heard the person's complaint i always say before you get caught up in it pay attention to who it's coming from be very careful because this will affect how you treat others so the idea here of just it means right when a person gives not only to the Lord in worship and living in obedience to God, but to his fellow brother, his fellow sister in Christ. You know, you say things like, man, you know, they ain't right. You're saying they're, they're just, they're not good people. They're, they're actions, right? They're, you get it? Anybody here, they ever used to call you lefty? Anybody here? That's because you weren't right. <laughs> Some of you will get that later. But, but the reality is, is that when we say that, he's not right. I've said that. I've said that, man, they're not right. Or that's not right. Or this is an injustice. That's what we're saying. God, God, God has to make this right. Or God is the only one that can make this right. And this always has to do with relationship with other people. So he's saying here, whatever's just, whatever's right. So you always have to do what's right, even if you're the only one doing it. And you know, today, even Christians get on other Christians for doing things that are right. You know that? And kind of even like a ministry like this, we've got a bunch of hoodies, you know, here. And hoodies are guys from the hood, you know. And it's like they don't like when you say maybe to the leader and they're in ministry like, hey, bro, you know, so-and-so was late, you know. Or, you know, they said they were sick and they weren't. They were watching a football game. Then it's like the brother gets all upset. He's like, man, he ratted me out. Ain't no rats in the kingdom, brother. Or they want to do that. They want to say, oh, he's a rata. Like, nah, bro, you're a rata, the way you're acting, man. You know, it's, 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 it's that thing where we, we, where we try to somehow, some way, you know, 
get outside of this. And you can't. So he's saying, deal with these things right. And so how do you, how do you, some guys say, well, you know, I don't want to say nothing because I don't want to be viewed like that. Well, this ain't the streets, man. If this is going to affect the ministry and it's going to affect people, and it's going to affect what God's doing in the body of Christ. You know something, you better say it. If not, you're just as guilty. And we fix these things and we move forward. And those who, you know, when you think on whatever's right in the eyes of God and people and you think about what is fair for everybody that's involved, this this really is what it is. It's an excellent way to understand Paul's meaning here. So whatever is just, whatever is right, whatever things are pure. Now, we know what purity means, right? But but he's this idea here in whatever's pure. This is how we should think of people. We should always see the purity in people and you know, this idea here, kind of what Paul is saying is how we think about others and how we give weight to things and ponder things and the value of things and filling our mind with, with innocent thoughts and especially about people, giving people the benefit of the doubt. Anything evil and anything that's defiling, well, you know, you stay away from those things. And letting those things take, you know, when you meet someone like that, when you meet someone who that's how they think, it's kind of hard when you're wanting to say something that's not right. You know, God uses that. God uses that. I mean, there's been times where, you know, I'll, I'll use me as an example because you guys don't get in the flesh. But there's been times where I've been in the flesh and I'm wanting to communicate something to someone because I want them to know. But they're so pure. That I say what I'm going to say and they don't even like entertain it. They just keep talking. And I'm kind of like, didn't you just hear what I said? And I'll say it again. And then, and then you know, when you kind of get their attention on it, they're like, Oh, you just got to give it to the Lord. Like they see no nothing. And that's so convicting. You're like, I should have just kept my mouth shut. Yeah, you're the one that looks like a fool. And you know what happens? The more you practice those things that are pure and our thoughts of, of, of purity towards others and you're not allowing your thoughts to be influenced by impure things about people, you, you know what that does is that helps you to be that way. And before you know it, a gossiper won't go to you. Now, I know I'm going to ask you a question here, and you're probably not going to raise your hand, but how many of you here like gossip? You like it? <laughs> you like the cheese me? <laughs> Nobody likes gossip. But how many of you have given ear to gossip? You don't like to admit it, but you have. And you say, well, I was just, I was just trying to be there for them. <laughs> we laugh, but you're, you're guilty of the gossip. You're, you're guilty of it. And what you're really doing is you're, you're hindering what God is doing, not only in your life, but in the life of that person that's gossiping. And so the point I'm trying to get across is the more you practice this and the more you see people the way God sees them, which is very hard to do, and that can only be done through prayer because it's not within us. Let me tell you something. When somebody comes and they're gossiping, you're able to do what, what those have done where they just think of all these pure things and right things. They don't want to think anything negative of that person. And, and it's kind of like no matter how many times you say it, they're not giving into it. That helps you from hearing things you shouldn't hear and get involved in things you shouldn't be involved in. And, you know, because gossip is a work of the enemy. And a gossiper can never meditate on these things. They can never fixate upon these things because you want to know what? Whatever's true, whatever's noble, whatever's just, whatever's pure is not in a gossiper's vocabulary. It's the opposite of everything that we said not to. But the enemy loves that. So Jesus said, 
in Mark chapter 7 in verse 15 that it's not exterior things that make us impure, but what's on the inside. It's not what goes into your body, Jesus says, that defiles you. You are defiled by what comes out of your heart. Mark chapter 7, verse 15. We must hide the pureness of God's word secretly in our heart. We, we got to keep that thing in there to keep us from sinning against God. And isn't that what the psalmist says in Psalm 119 and verse 11? He says, I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. And we do this by reading his word and memorizing his word. You might say right now, you know, you don't understand what I'm feeling, what I'm going through. But but, you know, listen, try it, do it. Trust me, it works. Why? Because the Bible says this in Psalm chapter 12 and verse six. The words of the Lord are pure words like silver refined in a furnace on the ground, purified seven times. The purity of God's word. Psalm 119 and verse 140 says, your promise is well tried and your servant loves it. Psalm 119 and verse 9 goes on to say, how can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. To consistently think on whatever is pure. The believer must take captive every thought to the obedience of Christ. We looked at this the last time we were here last week. And remember what James says in chapter 3 and verse 17. He says, to the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are corrupted and do not believe, nothing is pure. In fact, both their minds and their conscience are corrupted. So with this here, he says, the things that are pure... What is the goal here? Well, the goal is producing purity of thought, purity of purpose, purity of words, purity of actions. This is what the spiritual leader must do. Keep yourselves pure. First Timothy chapter five and verse 22. You know, this is what Paul desired in second Corinthians chapter 11. Look at what he desired. He said these words, for I am jealous for you with the jealousy of God himself. I promise you as a pure bride to one husband, Christ. You know what his desire was? His desire was to present his spiritual children as pure before the Lord. And, and he's showing them these are the things that can ruin that. Lovely. Whatever things are lovely. Now this also has the same idea of that which is just or that which is right. That is our love toward other people. And in other words, here, the things that are lovely, well, dwelling on this are things that inspire us and others to love one another. The lovely things are that. Loving one another, working toward that. You know, the Bible is very clear that, you know, when we practice love, Feel in our minds and our hearts with God's love. God is the one who, who brings us together in this unity of peace because God is love. And this is what Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Love is patient. Love is kind. It's not jealous. It's not boastful. It's not proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It's not irritable. It keeps no record of wrong, of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never fails. Love never gives up. So whatever is lovely, the idea here is practicing this. In 1 John chapter 3, in verses 16 through 18, it says, We know that what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us. So we also ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. And if someone has enough money to live well and sees his brother or sister in need, but shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that person? This will kind of build to what Paul is going to talk about, kind of closing out this book. But loving others fulfills every requirement of God's law. Remember in Romans chapter 13, jot it down, verses 8 through 10. He says this, let, no, 
Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law, the commandments. You shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And whatever other command there may be are all summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. So now when you see this here, you're, you, you, you kind of see what, what Paul is saying here. Whatever's, whatever's lovely. And whatever things are of good report. You know, all of us like a good word, right? But, but what does this mean here of good report? Well, well Paul understands really the, the direct influence of our thoughts and how they have an influence on our spiritual well-being. And he's saying, listen, those, those things that we hear, those things that we receive, those things that we, that we take in, meditating on this good, a good report, well, it involves filling our minds with praiseworthy thoughts. So this is kind of going back to summing up everything that he's saying. Building a godly character in one's life. Now, whatever's of good report is, is that which is true. Paul mentions this in the start of Philippians in chapter 1 in verses 20 and 21. He, For I fully expect and hope that I will never be ashamed, but that I will continue to be bold for Christ as I have been in the past. And I trust that my life will bring honor to Christ. And whether I live or die, for to me living means living for Christ and dying is even better. This is what Paul is saying here. This is a godly character. And, you know, it reflects on the Lord's goodness and glory, but also to others. Whatever is of good report, the things that are good, meditate on these things. And, and when you look at the Bible, the Bible is filled with a good report. It's a good report from Genesis to Revelation. And essentially, you could see that all these things, what Paul is really saying to them is he's saying, listen, be in the word of God. Be in the word of God. Paul says there in verses four and six in chapter one of the book of Philemon, he says, I always thank my God when I pray for you, Philemon, because I keep hearing about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all of God's people. Boom, there's a good report. He's saying, I've been encouraged by this report. I heard a good report. Man, that blesses me. In Colossians chapter 1 and verses 3 and 4, he goes on to say here, we always pray for you and we give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and your love for God, for all of God's people. When we hear good reports of like, man, this is going on over here and that's going on over there and what you guys have, all these, this encourages us. There's an encouragement here. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 2. The only letter of recommendation we need is you yourselves your lives are a letter written in our hearts everyone can read it and recognize our good work among you what a good report they were getting from these guys and paul was saying as they were hearing how you know they were living for the lord paul says man you know how encouraging that makes me feel when i hear that you guys are serving the lord and you guys are faithful and you guys are you know, kind of like what I shared with you guys on Sunday, you know, that gentleman that I sat down and had lunch with for the conference. And he says, you know, this is the third time I've been here. This is the most hospitable church, you know, attentive to the needs. And I, that makes me feel good. Because I wasn't the one doing it. He's not over there stroking my ego and patting me on the back. But he's I, I you know, people always say, you know, how about your church? Is it a good church? <laughs> and I tell them, well, I think it is. Not because I'm the pastor and I've planted and pioneered this church. No, it's a good church because there's good people there. A little bit crazy, but good. They're a blessing and they're encouraging. And, and you know, God uses it. And I tell them, you would be blessed. Come and check it out. And this is what Paul is saying, whatever. So notice what he's saying here. The most influential sermon, the most life impacting that we will ever preach to unbelievers is not one of words, but how we live. 
like that phrase by St. Francis of Assisi, preach the gospel often and when necessary, use words. If there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. And then he says in verse 9, look at what he says here. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. In other words, he says, put into practice what you saw me do. Practice these things. And I love this encouragement here that Paul is giving them because he's encouraging them to not just live it, or excuse me, not just to hear it and receive it, but to live it. What you've learned of me, what you received, what you've seen. The theme of imitation appears here in this, and he's saying, do these things, emulate these things from me. So this is what we're to do. We're to emulate leaders that practice these things. Emulate those leaders who set their mind on the Lord God. Watch them. Watch how they see life through the lens of God's word and how they read the word of God and how they talk about the word of God, how they value the word of God. And Paul says, when you do this, the follower will know more of God's power. The follower will know more of God's peace and more of God's presence. In Isaiah chapter 23, or excuse me, 26 in verse 3, it says, You will keep the mind that is dependent upon you in perfect peace, for he is trusting in you. How true is that? Set your mind on things above. Set your mind on praiseworthy things Give your burdens tonight to God and know that his perfect peace will rest upon you, which Paul says here surpasses all understanding. And so he's shepherding this this lovingly church. He's doing it with love and he's doing it with wisdom and faithfully urging them to be united and to rejoice in the Lord. Paul is actually telling them, you have nothing to worry about. Be gentle. Replace anxiety with God's peace through prayer and think on praiseworthy things and meditate on these things and remember the hope that you have in Christ Jesus, who he is. Jesus has never went back on his word. He's never broken any of the commandments. Jesus is faithful. And this point that he's saying is he's encouraging them and he's saying, listen, Jesus has done it all. and He's able to do it. He's able to give you peace with God because he paid the penalty for your sin. And then he says in verse 10, but I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again. Though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Isn't that interesting? This could be another reason why they were anxious. He says, you, you gave, you, you met the need. There's gratitude here. Paul is expressing gratitude. And he says, he's thanking God for the generosity of other believers. He's saying, I thank God because you guys have been faithful in that. And notice something here. Their support encouraged him. Why did it encourage him? It's not because of the amount. It was because Paul understood they lacked opportunity. In other words, it was a struggling church. Perhaps this was a difficult time. You know, churches go through financial difficulties. And we've had our fair share. We had our fair share of financial difficulties, you know, and and, and God has always taught us something in those times. You know, there's, you always kind of have the tendency to want to kind of, you know, man, you know, we, we need to let them know, <laughs> you know. And, but, but God meets the need. He's faithful to meet it. We just have to be faithful in giving. So you kind of see something here. He's saying here, I rejoice in the Lord that your care for me has flourished again, though you surely did care, but you lacked Opportunity. Notice something here that he's really highlighting. He says, your concern and your care meant more to me than the gift. That was kind of like Paul's heart. He uses an adverb here and he says, greatly. He's saying he's so happy. 
He's thrilled by the Philippians' renewed support. And even though they went without it for a period of time, he, he reminds them that just because they didn't give in a difficult time, he says their concern was more of a gift than anything. You see, they had the right heart. Paul here is super grateful for the Philippians and their concern about him and their generosity. So what is he doing here? Paul is thanking them. And he's doing it in a way in which I think we can learn from. Not by manipulation, not by flattery, and not by silence. He's not saying things like, you know, that his thanksgiving, he wants it to be interpreted as a request for more money. Now that you're giving, hey, maybe you can make up on all those back payments kind of thing. No, he thanks the Lord. He thanks God that, hey, you know, you're now you're able to do. Nor with flattery. He's not going over and saying, you know, hey, listen, he doesn't tell the church, I'm, I'm dedicating this prison cell to you. I'm putting a plaque up with your name on it. No, no, Paul is simply saying here, listen, I just want to thank you. He doesn't go over the top with the thankfulness. And, and nor does he stay silent and just, not even show any gratitude. He mentions it. He rejoices in the Lord that they're able to do it. He reminds them that the only reason why they have been giving, whether they started and stopped and now are continuing or not, the point that he's making is it's only by the grace of God that this even happens. And he's encouraging them to trust the Lord. So, Paul's example here is they blessed him and he thanks God for them in front of them. I thank the Lord for you. I thank God for, for what you've done and that's what we're to do. We're to thank the Lord for those who care for us. There should be gratitude in that, you know, and, you know, because Paul was a man who you'll see here in verse 15 he says this to the Philippians. He says, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. You see, we don't realize sometimes what all goes in, what all comes in and what's all needed. But ultimately, God's the one that provides and he uses the means for that. So with this here, we see this encouragement where Paul is kind of saying here, you know, not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. Paul's saying, I'm not over here thanking you guys because I want more. I'm just, I'm just thankful that, that you guys are able to do. Or when's the next check coming? <laughs> when do we get more kind of thing? You know, there's something about living on faith and trusting the Lord. And, and Paul encourages that here but he's saying i learned to be content contentment guys is something that is that is rare it's rare it was rare in paul's day how could he be content paul is saying he's content he's living in a prison cell and he's content so you can jot this down contentment is unconnected to our circumstances that's what paul is showing right here because paul's in prison and He's confined and he's in a sense suffering. And Paul is saying here, I'm content even here. How could you be content there? And how could you be content even when they lacked and they weren't able to give? And how can you be content in those things? Well, this is what Paul was doing. He was encouraging them in their giving and, and encouraging them to, to excel in their giving. This is one of the things that I think sometimes here that ministers kind of shy away from in the church of talking about income and resources and these things because, you know, that's what the world says. You know, the church just wants your money. But, but here, Paul is not talking about picking up a love offering. Paul is thanking them um, for their gift, but also their service. Because serving is also a form of giving. 
But what Paul is saying here is he's going to walk them through that Christ is enough. So his joy and his rejoicing was not just because they gave. He rejoices in the Lord. If there was a care for him, yes, the finances are coming. But ultimately, he stresses in this text that that his contentment didn't increase or decrease based on material possessions. He was just content. In other words, even kill. And there are some that feel that, you know, more stuff will bring deeper satisfaction. Paul is saying you have all that you need in Christ. And, and, you know, that is perhaps kind of what people experience today, what they wrestle with. And this is what they shoot for. If I could just have a little bit more, I'll be content. You know, when Rockefeller found all, you know, this wealth and the oil in the Middle East and all of that and you know, started making all this money in the rich, you know, the Rockefeller dynasty, you know, the richest people in the world, you know, the history of the world, whatever the case might be. And all of that, when he was asked, I believe it was Rockefeller, when he was asked, you know, how much is enough? He said, just a little more. Just a little more. The contentment for him came by the resources that were coming in. Paul was saying, contentment, can happen in any circumstance because of who Christ is. And contentment, in a sense, is the result of these things that he says to think upon. No money can pay you to think on those things. These are things that you you look at and you say, you know what, today I'd rather think on what is true, what is noble, what is just, what is pure, what is lovely, what is of good report. Because there's enough of the opposite of these things in the world today. You're going to go back home and some of you are going to face the opposite of those things. What good is it to think on these things if all I have is the same situation here happening in my home or in my life? Or you go back to work, you're like, here we go again. Can I be content? Well, Paul says here in this next couple of verses that contentment is learned. Learned contentment. Now, I'll tell you guys this, like most of you, maybe maybe not, but, you know, some things will bring a lack of contentment in your life because of anxiety. And you're kind of like, it's not so much that you want, you know, you want more because you want to be rich. You want more because you, you know, you have a need. And that can go either way. But when you let the Lord fill your need, when you let God take care of this, this is what Paul is going to walk them through. God will meet your need. God will take care of it. You got to trust the Lord. You know, and I was, you know, reading through some material and listening to a story of a guy who was talking about, you know, a family that a pastor that was struggling financially. And 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 they took this word very serious to cast all, you know, To cast all your cares upon the Lord, you know, bring it to him, you know, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the pastor and his family, they they only had like like less than a quarter in their account, like literally 13 cents. They were struggling. They didn't even have toilet paper. So they started praying. They just prayed. They just said, Lord, we have this need. Lord, and all of this. And so he's sharing this story and he says he shares it because it's kind of funny, but it's kind of how God works and something so small. But if you need toilet paper, that's not a small thing. That's serious business, right? But they prayed for that and many other things. And then all of a sudden, it's kind of like the youth group from their church just so happened to decide to go and play a trick on their pastor. And so they teepeed one of the trees in front of his house. Now, it wasn't that the toilet paper was on the tree. It was that they removed one roll, only used one roll, and left the rest of the toilet paper pack on their doorstep. And they're like, the Lord met the need. I read that. I started cracking up. I said, that's when you get the paint gun, a paintball gun out and let them have it, man. (laughs) But 
in situations like that, sometimes things come just so simple. The Lord's just like, oh, you got, there is nothing too difficult for the Lord. When you trust the Lord, even with those things that others might think, that's ridiculous. I'm sure. How's God going to do that? He's able. And then you learn there, man, I can trust God for everything. And, and so when Paul says this, as he's learning contentment, Paul says, I learned contentment. I learned contentment in Christ. And he goes on to say here, I know what hardship is like. You might say, well, did Paul know what hardship was like? Do you know what hardship is like? I know. I just don't. Listen, when I've gone through things in, in the years of me pastoring, and some of you have known me my entire pastorate, I've never used this pulpit to talk through the financial issues that I was having or things that I was going through. Never. Because I know what can happen. Some will be motivated by giving toward that. You know, man, you got to let it, you, you got to let us know. You got even my board. That was one of their biggest pet peeves. Well, you know, you got to let us know what your needs are. God will take care of it. I've seen the Lord do it. I shared not too long ago with you guys a few weeks back, a couple of services on how the Lord provided that home. It's crazy how the Lord does things. You just got to trust the Lord. And you can't never Never, never retract from those promises that God has written in your heart and the things that God has shown you that he's doing in your life. And this is what Paul is saying to them. And Paul is saying, listen, I know what it is to suffer. I, I've been in difficult situations. And he says, I know how to be abased. The idea behind the word here, abased, what Paul is pointing out is he's saying here, I know how to live humbly. And sometimes that's just where we are. We're living humbly. We call it paycheck to paycheck. We call it robbing Peter to pay Paul, right? You know, I remember years ago, early on, you know, I was probably in my early 20s and those check cashing places, you remember those? You get the loan, man, they knew how to get you, man. And I remember I was kind of going to this because every week I needed that extra help, you know, so I would go and write them a and they were making like 20, 30 bucks off of me every time I would pay them back. And I remember one time it's like, man, you know, I... I wanted a chalupa from Taco Bell, man. And I said, they, they took my last 30 bucks, man. I can't even get a chalupa. <laughs> I says, and I vowed that day. I says, I will never go back to that. Lord, I'm going to trust you from here on out. I mean, it was all good. I mean, you know, they were making their money. I was getting what I needed at the time, you know, but I couldn't get the chalupa. So. You guys might laugh, but that was my vow to the Lord. I says, I'm never going to do this again. I'm going to trust you. And that week, it was just, they were sending people early home and cutting hours. And it was like, man, this is not good. I'm not going to get the chalupa ever, you know, kind of thing. And all of a sudden, the boss comes up to me, and he's just like, hey, man, you know, I, I want to, uh, you know, I, I want to help you out. I says, really? I go, how? He says, you know, I just, I, wa I want to give you a bonus. I said, what kind of bonus? He goes, like a bonus, like money. I says, really? He says, and in my mind, I'm thinking like, oh, they're probably going to give me like a $100 gift card. Because that's what they would do. They would give us gift cards and, you know, they'd hook us up. And then he just says, how much is your rent? I'm like, I'm like six fifty. dollars That's what it was then, right? He says, really? All right. I'm going to give you three months worth of rent. Boy, I, you know, that's the time when the Taco Bell came out with that big old box, you know, with the burritos. And, boy, that's the first thing I did. I loaded up on that sucker, man. <laughs> and I never went back to those places. You guys act like you ain't never done that before. You probably borrowed money from your poor old mom and never even paid her back. Like, she good. That's my mom. She good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I would never borrow money from my mom because she was the one always taking care of me when I was in prison. I'd feel horrible. You know, it's like, man, you took care of me when I didn't have, you know, so I'd go do these things. And I did it all, guys. Sold cans. Anybody here ever sold cans? Don't be all shy over here, man. Some of you are old tecatos, man. You were over there getting your cans every morning like, eh. That's why you're laughing. You know what I'm talking about. But you do everything. And then all you have to do is you realize all this striving and all this. And it's like, why am I worrying? All you got to do is trust God. 
and be a good steward with what God gives you. And you treat it like it's his money and he's just lending it to you. And then you honor the Lord with it. And what does God do? It's not about a prosperity gospel. This is about stewardship. God multiplies. He multiplies your gifts, your talents, your resources, your possessions. God does it. When you take care of the things that God has given you, God takes care of you because you use it for his honor and his glory. Let me tell you something. When you learn to give, here we go. You guys, thank the Lord we don't pick up offering on Wednesday night. But when you give and you learn the principle of giving, you can never outgive God. So, you know, on Sundays when that plate comes around, you guys are like, I thought you were Calvary Chapel. I don't know why you pass the plate. Calvary puts the box in the back. We got the box, too, but we pass the plate. Nothing wrong with that. I just feel like I have to give. You should be giving. Well, how much do I give? Whatever you purpose in your heart, because God loves a cheerful giver. But I'm going to tell you one thing. The word cheerful giver doesn't mean you give with a smile on your face and say, I'm obeying the word of God. That actually means those who give hilariously. And they give because they know they can never outgive God. And I've learned that principle as a believer since day one. You give, you can never outgive God. You can't. Our church has been a giving church and God has always provided. And maybe you've never understood that principle and maybe you've never practiced it. Well, guess what? This Sunday will be a good time for you to do it. It's the truth. Try it. Give it to him and see what he does with it. It was D.L. Moody who learned the principle of tithing. D.L. Moody, we know Moody Institute is created by this man, right? And great preacher. We read a lot of his material. He was a shoe salesman. Shoe salesman back in the day, they went door to door. So Nikes, Vans, all that stuff, right? How we today, we go to the store. They they went to the door to door and they were selling you shoes. That's how they did it. And when he became a believer, he started believing the Lord for for that. He says, I'm going to give. I'm going to. And what you know what he did? He says, I'm going to give, but I'm not going to give 10 percent. God, I'm going to give you 90 percent of what I make. And I'm going to trust you, Lord, that I can live off that 10 percent. You know that that's what God did. He multiplied that 10 percent. And D.L. Moody gave 90 percent of his income to the ministry. And lived the rest of his life off that 10 percent. And God blessed that ministry outrageously when he needed a building you know what he did he went in this big old school and he couldn't afford the building you know and he went in there and he's sitting in this meeting and they're talking about well we're gonna have to do this and we're gonna have to do that and then and then they says you know and and then he just the lord tells him hey you know tell them to donate it to you that'll take them out of their tax problems and he just suggested that and they gave him the building isn't that crazy and it's like story after story when you believe god see you can never outgive god now, trust me, I, 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 I am tempted to preach, you know, on these things like this, but it's just simple. You trust God with your resource. It's like we trust God with everything else except our wallet. We're like, that's in our back pocket for a reason. I'll give you my spouse and I'll give you my kids, Lord. <laughs> but I'm not going to give you my wallet. Malachi chapter 3 Right. That passage everybody uses. It's the only time the Lord says to test him. In the era of giving. Nowhere else. God, you might say, why, why does God do that? Because he knows what money does to man's heart. You can become very anxious when your money is kind of funny and your change is kind of strange. Right. You resort to all kinds of things. Let's close tonight. We're going to zip right through this year. Paul says here, I I know what it is to suffer. I know what it is to be hungry. I know what it is to abound. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. All things. All things must be taken into account here of the context. What is the context here that Paul is talking about? Need. I can be abased. In other words, I can be without and I can abound. I can have a lot. And you might say, God, How can he live this way? How can he be this way? He says, because of Christ who strengthens me. It's Jesus. Christ is enough. Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but only you. 
For even in Thessalonica you did aid once and again for my necessities. Not that I seek the gift. Notice what he's seeking here. I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. God blesses it, guys. Indeed, I have all and abound, and I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma. He goes from talking about giving to now Old Testament practice, and he's saying, when you give and you give sacrificially, it's like a sacrifice to God, like those sacrifices in the Old Testament that went up as a sweet aroma. When you practice these things, he says, you are the same way before God and my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and according to his glory by Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. And I love these three verses here. Listen to what he's saying here. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you. But especially, listen to this, those who are of Caesar's household. Caesar, yes. That Caesar, yes. His household, yes. Paul was ministering to them. And he's saying, your prayers have not gone in vain. Your resources have not gone in vain. Your support has not gone in vain. You guys not giving up on me has not gone in, gone in vain. We're reaching even Caesar's household. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You might say tonight, Pastor, I don't have no more in me to give. In Christ Jesus you do. Trust the Lord. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, With all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding, and in all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your 